so good morning and good mo good evening all uh, thank you for joining today we have martin miles with us he is a sitecore expert and dotnet technical solution architect involved in this uh, industry with uh, more than 20 plus years and uh, he is also six time sitecore mvp from 2017 to 2022 Today's topic is uh, the mastery of Sitecore upgrade. And uh, if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to drop it in the chat window. We will uh, have uh, 10, 15 minutes uh, for question and answer at the end of the session. Yeah, over to you. Good, good morning, everyone. Good morning, India. <laughs> My name is Martin Miles, as uh, I've been introduced, and uh, today we are going through the this very sensitive topic, the master of site corporates. And uh, the reason it's sensitive is because lots of uh, there is lots of material uh, in site core about upgrade, and it's quite confusing. So sometimes you don't know which is the right way, which is the not right way. So uh, in this session, I'll try to cover every single bit of this uh, site core upgrade so that um, you will benefit from it. And at the end of the session, there will be a link to my blog post where you will find uh, all the supporting materials for this presentation. And it, it basically will be some sort of instruction. So if you follow this blog post, uh, while doing upgrade or plan an upgrade, it will save you lots of times. And if you, for example, upgrade from version two something to 10.2, uh, I promise you it will save you probably three times of your effort. You, you can do this upgrade three times quicker. So let's start. A familiar screen, right? This scary screen. And uh, seven hours are spent for troubleshooting this kind of unobvious errors. And uh, as soon as I was about just overcoming one issue, then another runtime error pop up again and again and again. And these issues are very difficult to troubleshoot, to understand, and to sort this out. So today I will take you through the uh, insights I learned and struggled while performing these side co upgrades. So what we'll cover is we'll go through tools, through tactics and approaches to updating the content. Uh, we'll cover about the upgrading the code base, configuration of course containers, uh, because we, do, we deal lots of with containers. So that, that will, I promise that will be interesting next half an hour. So to start with, let's think about why people do the upgrades in principle. So this is not an easy exercise, but but why do we need to do upgrades? And the answer is very simple. It's a uh, carrot and stick motivation. So every new year, uh, mainstream support expires for one or maybe a few side conversions. Uh, and that means that Sidecore still provides security updates and fixes, but they do not support development and compatibility queries any longer. So for example, on my screen, you will see um, support phases for product. Um, that was a stick motivation, but speaking about carrot motivation, companies upgrade due to the new features or because they simply want some get, and get a new experience. So for example, with the latest 10.2, you can use Next.js to statically render MVC components to HTML and incrementally convert the MVC application to a JSS application. And that alone opens the door to modern opportunities to many legacy MVC websites, which there are lots uh, for the day. And having the latest version is especially valuable in front of composable DXP. Uh, we already see part of it uh, in action there already take place, but there's lots of material now on the blog posts and uh, on YouTube about what is composable DXP, how to get prepared. So I will not cover that, uh, at least in this session. Uh, I will do another presentation about how would you migrate from uh, existing legacy solution into composable DXP directly. So we'll talk about planning the upgrade because proper planning is the key to success. And uh, how do we perform the planning? First of all, and the most we need to assess the solution. So how much is it customized? 
Um, we know that upgrading vanilla side code costs you very minimal effort, but with uh, the more custom code that requires more labor uh, commit to commit to make it happen. Also, are there any technical depth or issues that are existing to uh, the project? This will affect your time scale. They will impose additional risks. So it's better to know those in advance. If you get an access to any of existing docs, that would be a perfect place to start. So it will likely give some answers to the previous point and uh, find the details about the environments, about the code branches, about which code branch deployed to which environment and how it works all together. Uh, one of the things you will be definitely interested in is finding the details about existing CI CD pipelines. So please do that as well. So another thing you need to do is uh, find the custom configuration which was made to the site core. Uh, further, this, further down the session, I will explain how to do that um, in more details. And finally, talk to stakeholders who, if not your stakeholders, know the most of the details and they are mostly interested in the success of the upgrade operation. It sounds logically that the more versions you jump through, the more complicated upgrade process will be. However, this is not a rule of thumb because some versions have very minor changes and uh, those could be upgraded with minimal efforts. But some others, they are totally opposite and they may, may be <laughs> as difficult as the hell is. That is exact reason why 9.3 stands out of this version chain. Uh, as it happens that this particular version took the most breaking changes, uh, most of the deprecations, most of internal housekeeping into the kernel, um, and all these evils uh, took place for that particular 9.3 version than any other version did. One of the most valuable planning activities is uh, studying release notes for every single version which is on your upgrade path. And please pay special care to uh, these two sections, which, which one are deprecated, removed, and another is breaking changes. Uh, so you will identify the functionalities which are no longer supported. And uh, that includes third party add-ons, modules. And uh, in some cases, they will even tell you some possible alternatives. So with new platform features, uh, license file format changes with time. And even if you have the most permissive license, your old license file may be not, in, not compatible with your newer platform. And uh, that, for example, what happened when version 9 was released. And if, I, if my member tells me right, it happened with version 10. So this is very good advice to care in advance as the process takes some time. So please uh, check that with your account manager. They will be always eager to help. When it comes to updating and upgrading software, there are two primary approaches to consider. The first is uh, upgrade existing instances, which means uh, when upgrade is applied to all the environments, it's being executed on all the existing instances. And another one is in opposite, is clean approach, where we create a clean environment uh, in parallel and sidecore instances, then we move data and we, we fix uh, the compatibility issues. So basically this is lift and shift. Uh, for development environments and upgrade scenario, my preference is always to start with a clean vanilla instance um, of that target sidecore version that runs in parallel. And uh, we will be discussing the upgrade, that upgrade in parallel uh, only during this uh, session. So every solution is unique and every team is also unique. So estimates definitely must consider all these factors along with the previous relevant experience of your team members. So this is a diagram that shows an optimistic view on a team of two experienced sidecore professionals. So these two are performing the upgrade in four typical sprints. So while they share the pool of tasks between each other, one of them is primarily focused on the code base and upgrading the code base, while another more cares about DevOps things. And once again, this is not a guidance of any sort. Uh, it's no assessment. It's just a high level uh, view on your team's activity through sprints. So before heading to the upgrade tactics, let's quickly recap some upgrade tools that we did have over the time and how those performed. 
So this diagram shows that at every single time there is an official upgrade solution for the existing ist instances. So we'll go through each of them now. The first is Sidecore Express Migration Tool. In a lift and shift, you can use Sidecore Express Migration Tool to move over data from your old instance to a new one. It supports to migrate from previous old versions to Sidecore 9 initial version. And Express Migration Tool copies all items and files from Sidecore instance at a time. Then it also supports uh, the migration of remote servers. Uh, the next one is Sidecore Update Center. It was introduced in Sidecore 9.0. Uh, second update of it, and it, it is valid up to Sidecore 10.1. So you can find, download, install, and manage updates and hotfixes for Sidecore platform and Sidecore modules through this tool. Uh, the update syntax accesses a package management service provided by Sidecore. Um, this is controlled by the connection stream, which you see at the bottom of the screen. And of course, you can install and provide service yourself for that purpose. Okay, we have reached upgrade tactics. Now let's talk through them uh, because those can significantly help you upgrade progress. So a fix in the state and being able to switch between them as quick as possible is crucial for productivity when working on instance upgrade. Small mistakes are absolutely inevitable and we actually need some sort of undo button for the whole process. So we already have these for the code base. Uh, we all know we have Git with its ability of switching between the branches. But what about the published side? What about indexes, certificates, and all the miners that matter? Even database backups are not the fast and straightforward. So what comes into mind is uh, fixing the whole state of a working machine. So something that virtual machines can do for us. And luckily we have at least one tool that uh, ticks everything we need. So that's Hyper-V, it, it is free. It's included with every single uh, release of Windows Pro. And I believe you are using Windows Pro at least for your development. It works extremely fast with, with solid state drives, maximum integrated in your operation system. So all this copy paste, all that works. Uh, it has perfect networking. You can create backups and move them to different machines between hosts. So another thing is that has universal, universal virtual drives, which are also pluggable uh, between your instances, uh, between your machines and in, into the cloud as well. But unfortunately it needs lots of disk space. So you will need a relatively fast solid state drive and you should mine the disk space because that one easily gets eaten by multiple snapshots as you progress. And I would recommend having at least one terabyte drive. Uh, probably that would be the minimum you'd need to have for productive work on the upgrade of uh, average site core solution. Now we are confident with the reverting bad things quickly, but how about redoing successful steps? So you may ask, why do we need that? Well, with a lot of monotonous and repetitive actions, one can lose very much of valuable time for things they will redo again and again. So I will describe you some potential use case. Let's think about when someone spent the last two hours upgrading NuGet references for a Helix solution with 100 projects on it. So that's uh, quite a monotonous and long work. And unfortunately, at last minute, something went totally wrong. And uh, you, of course, you can easily restore to the latest HPV checkpoint. And that will take less than a minute. But should you repeat all these monotonous steps again and again with NuGet packages? No, that's not the right way of doing things. So one, of course, could think, why not to make restore points more often with your virtual machine? Well, you can do, but creating those for every minor step seems to be an overkill here. And uh, hyper we will quickly eat out all your disk drive space. And it's fairly difficult to perform an upgrade of everything from a first attempt. Um, we know that we will have to repeat the successful steps again and again and again, likely. So the only matter would be automating them. So we have PowerShell, which is built in the operation system and that's best natural uh, 
tool that fits for such activities because you can leverage PowerShell for any sort of automation, for system tasks, for jobs, for mass replace configuration, and uh, even code base with regular expression application. That's my favorite, and I will revert to this uh, tactic and technique numerous times over this uh, presentation. You can also back up, restore databases, uh, and same for web application, manage your infrastructure, local or even in a cloud. You can also leverage Sitecore PowerShell Remote to operate your instance. In that case, uh, you will be able to manage content security. You will be able to publish indexing all that from your PowerShell window. So returning to this example I mentioned before, what could and should be a good idea to write these scripts for? Ooh. OK, so when you do upgrade the references in a large solution that actually on your disk ends up with just a few lines of difference in your project file and in your packages config files, which means that comparing the diff difference before and after with the diff tool, it's fairly easy to use PowerShell in order to process all such files performing regular expression re replace, which one I mentioned. Uh, not being a master of regular expression, you're of course unlikely to succeed to succeed with the first attempt, but with a quick and easy checkpoint restore option, you'll quickly master it, and uh, you will end up with the artifacts, uh, which are your successful scripts that could be reused in your future upgrades with minimal or no alterations. And I wrote a very uh, good article about PowerShell best practices. You may find it in my blog, so that will be referenced at the end of the session. So you can leverage it for automation, replace, backup, all those bits. In some cases, when you are performing a jump to a following version, maybe a few versions uh, of your, and your solution is relatively simple and uh, very close to vanilla, it makes sense to pitch proof of concept. So that will either give you a very quick win, or if it doesn't, then at least you it will identify all the traps and things you could and should improve. So ideally, that should be a one-day job for a single professional. It's also highly desirable to obtain a recent backup of master database. And I do realize it's not always possible, sometimes due to your volume or basically because of organization's security policy, especially when you're working as an external contractor. But why do you need that database? So firstly, you will restore this database along with your old solution to verify the code base you obtained uh, that works and performs exactly the same as on published websites. And next, you will update this database and use it with a new solution instance to ensure that also looks and works exactly as performed before. So this, is, this gives you a dual proof. So upgrade process takes uh, quite a decent amount of time, and it may be a case while a new site conversion released uh, meanwhile, so my best advice will be to stick to the newer version. So first of all, it may be not an easy task to do, especially if you are working for a partner rather than an end client and the version has been signed off. Uh, it will take lots of efforts to persuade stakeholders to consider the newer version and you'll have to motivate your argument pretty well. So upgrading the solution while, while you are halfway done adds, of course, some time on top of it, but this will cost time less than upgrading uh, to a newer version once you went live with, the, with one before the latest. And this is what happens to me, for example, when I was working on 10.0 up, update one, uh, when the newer 10.1 got released. So switching to 10.1 actually cost me less effort than the original version because of its own features. And last but not the least, uh, this my advice may seem to be obvious, but please take it seriously. Document every minor step in all your decisions, motivation, and solution, because you will likely to go through that again, maybe several times. So save your scripts either. Even better job would be if you could wrap all your findings into a blog post and share the challenge and solution to that challenge with the rest of the world. And because our blogs are indexed, you will have help to many other people. And several times in my career, I Googled out my own blog post with a solution when faced the challenge. And of course, thanks to this uh, previously taken note, in this entire presentation became possible. All right.
when asking my colleagues for what is the biggest challenge while well, their upgrade experience, almost everyone responded that was migrating the content. But before migrating the content, depending on your level of ownership, it may be a good idea to undertake content maintenance. Most of these points are optional. However, they are very helpful. And speaking about the last point, um, which is a line. So let, let's go through them. So you want to remove legacy item versions, definitely. Uh, I, I've been working on some project where home item had 590 something versions and I hardly believe they needed all of them. So that's definitely what you need to do to clean the database. Uh, remove unused media for same reason because media takes lots of uh, volume. Optionally, you can take care of broken links, get rid of them. And the last one, uh, I will explain in a bit. So from 9.1 version of Sitecore, default Helix folders uh, start being provided out of the box with uh, known universal IDs. So those like feature foundation and project, but lots of Helix solution were done earlier and uh, their folder IDs do not match to those coming out of the box in later version. So for example, we created this uh, feature folders and of course your id was uh, generated randomly but then you have exact uh, exact item with the same path but the id is well known so lots of helix solutions were done earlier so folder id do not match this coming out of the box in later version and they will be likely serialized under incorrect parent id so you need to revoke serialization to match the correct folders coming out of the box that's definite task. So speaking about content migration option, the, the default way of occasional exchanging item between instances, which is known to every developer is a uh, site co-packaging. So however, this one is extremely slow. It does not work well with large packages. If for example, a package is few hundred of megabytes, you may face different challenges. This one is better option, it's free. Um, Sidekick has content migrate, migrator module uh, that is using rainbow serialization formats to copy items between instances. It works in a multi-threaded way. And unlike the previous point about packages, it's super fast. But please keep in mind that the both servers, target and destination need to have the content migrator installed on them. Uh, Sidecore Razzl is uh, known to most of you as a database comparison tool coming from uh, Sitecore. This is a quite intelligent way, however, of copying items also between the servers. Um, this software is unfortunately not free and it requires license. It does not have trial mode, but it's quite uh, good. So you can use it for um, moving content as well. Uh, there is also PowerShell extension content migrator, uh, a script to migrate content between Sitecore instances, which was written by Michael West, who is a PowerShell extension maintainer. Uh, so basically from an author of the module, and it also leverages Unicorn and Rainbow serialization. So this script is extremely fast, uh, but it also requires a Sitecore PowerShell extension with the remoting being enabled on both site core instances for target and destination. Another built-in tool to copy items between the databases uh, could be found in the control panel. So what you need to do to make it work is plug the target database as an external database so it could be seen in site core. Um, if you know this database selector at the right-hand side bottom where you have master, core, and web, there you will have another database which you will register. And in that case, with this tool, you will be able to copy item between databases in both ways. However, it's uh, also reasonably slow and it has some limited functionality, but this tool works. Uh, all previous methods are still being valid, but if you are migrating content to version 10.1 or even newer, there is much better way of dealing with the content and database upgrade. I will explain it in details just a few minutes. With all, uh, yeah. What about security? 
there are a few options to transfer users and roles from one instance to another. In that case, you can use standard package designer uh, that you can, where you can add roles, users, uh, everything you would like to package up and then install it on the target instance. Uh, an alternative to it is using serialization. Uh, so users and roles will be serialized under serialization uh, slash security folder so that you can copy these from source instance, put it to target instance, and then use a revert option. But both of these option, uh, they do not uh, transfer user passwords and instead they reset it. So the password is the reset to a random value when you use sidecore packages or it becomes default, which is B when using serialization. So that's not possible with these tools. But how do we deal with passwords in that case? So you can either reset password for the users uh, manually using the user manager application, or you can uh, uh, reset, users, they can reset password themselves by forgot your password option from the login screen, but make sure that mail server has been configured so that they will be sent recovery email. There is also transfer user password admin tool uh, under admin folder to transfer the password from source uh, and target databases. You need to have corresponding connection strings, strings between, for, for that to happen and also access should be enabled. But without having the required access, you could migrate everything manually, of course, uh, just with SQL. So the role and user data, data is stored using ISP.NET membership provider, and it's kept in SQL server tables in the core database. But also after 9.1, membership could be extracted from core into its own isolated security database. So either of two will have all your necessary data, which you will be able to manually migrate on SQL level. So now the biggest and the most challenging part of the upgrade is of course upgrading the code base. So let's start with a few very helpful tricks that will help you to identify the customization to a given project. So in order to estimate amount of customization for a solution, I do the following trick. First of all, I need to have a vanilla version of Sidecore that uh, an existing solution is using. After I make it and it is up and running, I come to WebRoot and do git init, and uh, then I commit everything. So you should not worry, it's just a local Git folder, which is initialized within the web root. So I do not push it any, anywhere. I'm simply deleting the Git files immediately after this exercise. So next, uh, I build and publish the code base as normal so that it, all these artifacts, uh, they are being deployed above vanilla site core uh, and dropped into web root. So, Finally, I again use my Git tool of choice, um, which will show the entire delta of all the customizations to a given solution. So with that trick, I could also easily see all the web config transforms. I could see mis mismatching or altered DLLs, for example, those that are coming with hot fixes and have the same name. So it's quite a helpful trick and it gives me overall feel on how much that instance varies from the vanilla instance of the same version. So with that previous trick mostly aimed showing the overall amount of customization, this one would be more specific about the changes into configuration. Uh, it shows all the patches and config alterations done on top of vanilla instance so that more precise estimation could be done. From previous step, we already have vanilla site core. So what we need to do is run show config uh, .aspx tool for generating the combined configuration um, against vanilla version. And we save it into an XML file. Next, once again, we perform build and uh, publish and deploy on top of that vanilla site core is normal. And once instance uh, gets up and running, you again run show config tool and save the output into a different XML file. So now you have to, now you have an actual solution configuration 
and you can compare it against the vanilla combined configuration uh, for the same version of the platform using the tool of choice. Uh, my favorite is uh, Beyond Compare, and I recommend using it. So for your convenience, you could also extract all the whole the whole delta for the whole solution between both into a single config file. And that config file will be a valid patch file to be used. You may also find after upgrading, you face dependency hell in terms of referenced assemblies, not playing well with each other. And that could take lots of time to fix. So every site core release contains assembly list featuring complete list of assemblies that are shipped with the release of uh, that uh, version. And uh, you will see it under release information section. For example, there are four, 400 exactly DLLs that have been provided with 10.2 XP platform. Um, DLLs must, must exactly match counterpart vanilla DLLs. That's important. Uh, in both version and also in size, unless that is a hotfix DLL. So with the previous uh, first trick, you can, you can identify all the mismatching DLLs. And with the second trick with the show config, uh, where those referenced DLLs are coming from. You may also perform a solution-wide search for specific faulty assemblies. And uh, then you, you will see all the results along with uh, their size and bytes, and at least at, at least one DLL would mismatch. So that one will point you to some specific project or Helix module where the faulty DLL is coming from. And to make your life easier, you could consider uh, PowerShell regular expression replace if you need to update a large number of references, that's what I always do. So this issue occurs due to dependencies used at your solution project that mismatch those DLL versions that are actually shipped with uh, vanilla side core. I will explain now. For example, you have some feature module and that one relies on sitecore.mvc dependency, uh, which in turn re relies on system.web.mvc, which is provided by Microsoft. So when you add sitecore MVC using NuGet package manager, it will pull the latest dependency. But that is not actually the latest dependency, what, which was uh, referenced when the time at the time when sitecore build was released. So it will be a newer one. And that will bring you to some sort of Mm -hmm. DLL health, uh, which uh, you can overcome, for example, by ignoring dependencies when adding depend when adding the library, you will you will be able to ignore dependencies. I'll show you how to do that, and then you can address correct dependency from official assembly list, or which which is better, you can adjust particular assembly binds into the latest version. And since you should not modify vanilla config manually, you may employ a config transform step as a part of your local build and deploy script. This situation was improved with 10.1 sidecore as libraries have been updated to the latest version and bindings became less strict. So sidecore no longer publish no reference NuGet packages. You may know that. For example, if you install 10 to package, uh, packages for 10.2, you will get a lot of dependencies installed with them. And that's not what we wanted. The correct way in this case is to use the dependency behavior option of the NuGet package manager. Uh, choosing the dependency behavior to ignore dependencies, it will on only install the package without any sort of dependencies. And this function also is available as a parameter switch in PowerShell if you want to add dependencies uh, from the PowerShell prompt. So just like project to project references and assembly references, package references are managed directly within project files rather than using a separate package config file. Um, so that is about migrating from old format of packages config to new package references. And unlike packages config package references lists only those NuGet packages that you directly install into the project. 
using package reference packages are maintained in the global packages folder rather than uh, in a package folder within the solution, which results in performing faster and it takes less disk space in case you have multiple solutions. Also, MS Build allows you to conditionally reference NuGet package and uh, choose package references per target framework, configuration, platform, or any other pivots. And there is also a script uh, power, in PowerShell, which you can use if you want to do the migration in bulk. I will reference this script in the blog post at the end of the session. Uh, we all know that 4.8 is the terminal version of uh, .NET Framework. And this one is being used from Sidecore 9.3 onwards. Uh, if migrating from earlier solution, uh, it will require you to upgrade ta target framework for every project within a solution. I personally prefer to do that with PowerShell OneLiner, but uh, there is a target framework migrator extension for Visual Studio that also bulk updates target framework for the whole solution. But of course, to benefit from this extension, you may need to update Visual Studio itself first so that it has the required target framework. But at the very minimum and least, and the most important, you must install the latest Visual Studio build tools, uh, which you, of course, uh, could upgrade on its own. So sometimes uh, third-party libraries become unsupported. Um, so what to do in that case? You need to do an investigation for each of those libraries uh, and decide what to do with them. So is this library indeed being discontinued? Because it could be refactored and uh, that would be done in a separate repository or fork. Try to Google that because you, know, you might be not the first user of that particular library and people have asked before and they have solutions. If it's open source, then you can uh, handle the upgrade yourself to an actual version that one you need. So does this library rely on some sort of removed features? That's a very good question to ask. So sometimes it's better to remove part of the functional relying on discontinued DLL. And uh, I came across this library, Sitecore Content Search Spatial, that performs geospatial search. Um, it has the source code available, but it, the source code did not been upgraded for the five years so far. And meanwhile, Lucene's search has been itself removed from Sitecore. And this library became no longer relevant as uh, it had reference Lucene. So as an outcome, the whole related business feature that uses this library uh, was descoped. Uh, I took it off the solution while doing upgrade only with the uh, option of later to rewrite it with a solar spatial search, which would be an adequate replacement. So speaking about dependence injection, Microsoft dependency injection became a built one uh, from version 8.2, which is default. It's fast, it's reliable, and it's pretty everything you may need. So just use the one. It supports all the lifetimes. So I hardly can imagine use case where you don't need it. You will need to update Glass Mapper to the version 5 unless you already made it. And that's itself quite a big challenge. So what has changed is package names have uh, changed to reflect the version of Sitecore, which they are working alone with. And it comes in three related packages. So Glass has a lot of changes in version five, most significant of which would be a new way of accessing content from Sitecore. So instead of iSitecore context using the, you, you will be using new iMVC context, iRequest contact, or maybe very exotical iWebform context abstraction if you are still using web forms, which I don't, which I, I believe you don't. So glass controller, it has gone. So you just inherit from a normal controller. Um, Similar happens to Glass View, as you just simply receive your model, as you normally do that in MVC. 
uh, glass loads glass is lazy loads by default now and after upgrading glass i faced a bunch of runtime errors that were difficult to identify which eventually i realized that happened due to a lack of virtual property modifier in model classes so if you see uh, this piece of code you must have this virtual uh, modifier which uh, is very strange because with old glass mapper models model properties still map correctly even without this virtual modifier but that's not any longer right so speaking about pipeline changes site core try and reduce breaking changes where possible but sometimes they are unavoidable and uh, with all site core upgrade some custom code and configuration will need to be updated to be compatible with. So the HTTP request arcs.context property has been removed in favor of HTTP context. In fact, it's just been renamed and uh, it results with a breaking change for all of your custom pipeline processes, which all you need to rewrite. I used my preferred approach of PowerShell regular expression to replace it with one liner. You see it on the screen and uh, it perfectly works. It will be referenced in the blog. And uh, it replaces all these uh, pipelines just in one shot. The second challenge is that custom processes uh, patched into your pipeline now require a mandatory attribute of resolve true. So unless you have this uh, attribute set up, it won't work. One of more change in version 9.3 uh, takes place with link manager in the way we get default option to build in URL. But why? Long story short, it, its internals have been written to the best and uh, it's mostly hidden from our eyes but what you need to know is an updated way of patching default url options which now is more elegant so compare compare this uh left block to the right block you see it's more nicer there are also caching changes so the solution i was upgrading had a publish and event uh, that was being configured to HTML cache clearing for different site instances. And uh, since 9.3 such behavior became a default after a publish. So it actually works other way around now. You have to disable HTML cache explicitly if you need to. So previous code will break and you have to remove the whole section. When upgrading legacy solution, you will likely come across of some of those. So uh, site core support addresses issue with providing support uh, DLLs and releasing hotfixes. Each of them sought out some certain issue which you need to investigate if it was resolved in the version you're upgrading to. So you will use this six digit support code to find more details uh, by using search at site core knowledge base website. And when it comes to hotfixes, which you see in the right hand side panel, uh they uh keep an original name of dll they replace so the knowledge base code could be found from the properties dialog once e you get resolved uh once once you see this feature uh under its uh, the issue under this uh, support has been resolved in a newer version you can safely remove this uh dll and you can remove the config Patch that reference this DLL. SXA is not an integral part of platform and it has its own upgrade guidance released along with each version. So I will only touch it briefly. And as is true for the rest of Sitecore platform, the biggest SXA change took place with uh, 9.3 release. So the biggest was velocity deprecation in favor of Scribbon templates that affects rendering variants, which is uh, most powerful feature of SXA, at least in my opinion. And uh, also since 9.3, SXA has a version parity with the underlying platform. So there's no more confusion. Web Forms for Marketers was deprecated in Sitecore 9.1. Uh, there is a community build tool to help converting uh, Web Forms for Marketers form and data into Sitecore experience forms. Uh, 
So this is a console application that migrates saved forms and data from either SQL database or from MongoDB, dependent which you've been using, to a destination site called forms SQL database. Uh, both Lucene and Azure Search became obsolete and removed. So please migrate your solution to Solar. But of course, it may take some significant effort. And to make your life easier, please consider using search stacks because that is that cares of installation, failover, security, maintenance, and scale and scalability. Managed Solar allows your developers to implement faster and spend more time than uh, before focusing on building and better search experience and less time supporting search infrastructure itself. Also, there were two issues I had to resolve while upgrading Solar. The first was related to core name mismatching and index name, which uh, easily gets fixed by uh, a config patch similar to the one you see here in top. And the second issue relates to a configuration that defines Solar index. Uh, so if you are indexing all the fields, uh, recently, from recent, it must be wrapped with document option tag. Uh, of correct type, otherwise it will not work. All right, so after introduction of XConnect, there, were a question, there was a question on what to do with all the existing analytics data, uh, which we have in MongoDB uh, when upgrading to 9X or maybe 10X. So to address that, site co-created a tool called XDB migrator tool, which migration tool, which works on top of data exchange framework it reads from MongoDB and it tries to XConnect server. And this tool uh, uses custom collection model to be deployed for, to both XConnect service and the XConnect index service. After rebuilding the XDB search index, you will get the data in your experience profile. And this tool has an optional verification feature, which in fact is a standalone database uh, that gets a record of each entity being submitted into XConnect. So you can use it for some sort of audit. When jumping through high number of versions, you will definitely face lots of site code DLLs and APIs being deprecated. I only listed a few examples here on the screen. And sadly, deprecation will require you either rewriting the code that consumes those uh, libraries or entirely eliminate this business feature. There are much more deprecations, so you will find those in release notes for every version you jump through. This is much more interesting part of an upgrade when it comes to site Cotan. So let's speak about containers. Containers are immutable. And that means that any change to file system within a container will be lost as soon as container restarts. So with Docker, you no longer deploy just your application code. Container uh, image is now the unit of deployment, which includes the whole environment, its operation system, application dependencies, all that being packaged in your container and being deployed. So therefore, your build process will have to be extended to build Docker containers and push these containers into container registry. Uh, your code, by, code base remain the same. And there are very minor changes like debugging changes a little bit. So instead of publishing artifacts into a web folder, we now build this image and we run a container from that image. Speaking about debugging, you now need to uh, first select a container and then select a process you would like to attach to. So this is one extra step. Database were not 100% compatible between the versions. Previously, one had to run an upgrade script against core and master in order to attach both to a vanilla target instance and progress with the rest of upgrade. Update script ensure the schema and uh, default out of the box content get updated, applying all the intermediate changes between the both versions. So the idea came to consideration that supplying empty databases with vanilla platform would eliminate the above need to uh, for everyone who upgrades database to operate at SQL admin level. But every version has its own unique set of default items. So where do we keep them? Because of container first way of thinking, there was a clear need storing those somewhere at the file system level. So it only was a matter of choosing and adopting a suitable data provider. And Protobuf from Google was a perfect choice, ticking all the boxes. And moreover, it's a very major technology. 
With that in mind, now having a database full of content, you can upgrade to a new version without even touching it. SQL databases stay up to date and the rest of default content gets updated by just substituting a protobuf uh, data resource file. Sitecore called call this approach items as resources. So I would recommend you also to look into the items as resources plugin for Sitecore CLI. You can create protobuf files with this plugin yourself um, with your items, which you can then bake directly into your container images. So, but how we upgrade, let's say, 8.2 database to, let's say, 10.2. Okay, since 10.1 and onwards database come with no content, it becomes a matter of removing the default items from uh, the SQL database, leaving the rest of content untouched. So that default content would come from an actual item resources file, which will instead be placed under updata slash items folder. And when upgrading after 10.1, it comes to purely replacing resource files, which naturally fit container file system way of doing business. A new tool comes into play, site core update app tool. This tool updates the core master and web databases. So the interesting is that you must download and use the version of the tool that is appropriate for the version and topology that you are upgrading from, not to, but from. It also helps with official module resources files for upgrading core master and web uh, for SXA, Sitecore PowerShell extension, data exchange framework, Horizon, and whatever else. Um, this uh, tool requires Sitecore license, so please be aware. But what do you do if you want to contain, containerize your own module? Uh, we now use something called Sitecore Asset Images instead of package as we did before. So first of all, you won't be able to install a Sitecore package, a classical one that drops DLL because bin folder on the container is being locked for your IS user. And you can unlock this folder with uh, a script if you plug to PowerShell, interactive PowerShell console, but that's not the right way of doing business in container world. And secondly, containers are immutable and they assume to be killed and instantiated. That's why it's not a good approach. So these images are in fact storage of your model assets and relevant folders based on the smallest Windows image, Nano server. So you, an asset is just a file, it's DLL, config, DAC pack. It also can be PowerShell script that you uh, may run from within that image container. Uh, also, you can uh, provide sole core, cores if, if your model requires them. So this uh, diagram shows how you can uh, create these asset images. So the, this is the file structure which you will have to manually create for your module. And you generally have two approaches. So you can use site items. If you have, um, so let's say you have a package for your module as you did it before. With Azure Toolkit, you will convert this uh, package into web deploy package, which is a CWDP file. Then you will extract DAC pack from your web deploy package and place it under the B folder. But much better approach would be using uh, CLI for uh, a plugin that creates uh, a protobuf image for you so that you simply just create this items that folder, drop it under the corresponding database folder and boom, here, here you go. You can also put PowerShell scripts and your static files come into these folders. And you will also have to have Docker file because that's uh, what you need to build an image. Uh, also, there is a tool called uh, Docker Asset Image Creator uh, written by Robert Hawke. You may find it on GitHub and that automates a uh, process of creating these asset images for you. So last but not the least, testing uh, 
the upgrade. So the bigger question, what you need to test, and uh, you must definitely test the following at least. So make sure your overall site has and look and feel. Check that you can create your uh, content, you can push it through the workflows if using workflows published, so all that works together. Um, before doing upgrade, there were some tasks like BAU tasks or whatever, so please make sure that you they also been picked up and they work as a part of your upgrade. So you can go through your task track and let's take, for example, for the past two weeks. So the next question is, should you do a manual or automated testing? And you have to find a proper balance between those because without automation, it becomes very much effort consuming. And at the same time, you cannot automate everything. It simply just does not make sense. Uh, also, if you upgrade to a new major version, you definitely must do a load testing. Um, that's something that uh, it's, it's crucial because your, your upgraded site may perform very differently. So monitoring is very crucial when you're going live. Uh, you need to inspect all the logs for any exceptions and address all these exceptions. So you also want to watch the metrics like you see here, right hand side, all of them look for some sort of anomalies and suspicious behavior because you, you may need to address those as well. Uh, you will need to establish a new CI CD pipeline for your upgraded solution. That comes without saying, but probably you have done that at some previous stages. Uh, security hardening is another exercise you must do before going live, uh, eliminating uh, potential vectors for attack. But luckily, Sitecore has a guidance on how to implement security hardening for a particular version. So just follow this guidance. There's nothing, anything specific, specifically dif difficult. If you do have a luxury of content freeze, well, then you are in a good world. That means no content would be created in a part of, in the time when you do upgrade. But if you don't have such a luxury, in that case, you will need to create a PowerShell extension script that will be run against your previous version where the authors have been creating the content. And that script should address the delta between the uh, database snapshot you take uh, using for a new version and the um, latest moment, let's say, in between now and package this uh, delta into some sort of package file and move to a new live instance so that you can publish it. Switching DNS is the actual moment when your new site starts taking the requests and all site, all, 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 all instances uh, become redundant. So the one gave it here is that you may need to go into your domain re domain name record and reduce the TTL, rec TTL value to some very minimal so that your changes take effect immediately. And then after going live, you will go back and revert this value to what it was before. And uh, last but not the least, you will have major and period. Uh, let's say you will have it for two weeks. Uh, that's where your old instance and new one will be running in parallel just in case something goes wrong and you will be able to switch to and to your old uh, version unlikely that happens and uh, if you follow my best advice uh, it won't happen but if there is still some sort of opportunity to that so please keep it for major and period and everything i just shared you will be able to find in my blog this is address of my blog and uh, please make a note of it and there will be just more co more content about this subject than i managed to squeeze in this uh 45 minutes so thank you very much for listening you may also find me uh, in socials and uh, if you are using telegram messenger please contact to sideco telegram that's the best news of the sideco world I, I publish them almost uh every day Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin.
uh, we have few questions if you would like to cover i unfortunately have to run but uh, let me quickly see uh, any specific migration steps to be taken uh, care especially for sxa sites um, yes with sxa one of the things you will need to address is uh, uh, the uh, gss and uh, css bootstrap being upgraded so that's a separate exercise. But for SXA, please follow the upgrade guide. They are providing it for every single version so that it's slightly outside of this uh, topic for today. Right. The one thing I didn't cover was uh, dynamic placeholders that have been uh, part of uh, Sidecoin from version nine. And uh, I explained that in my blog. So please, if you need that, please, please follow it. Yeah. I just simply forget to tell about that. Could you please give some points about the site cost solution upgrade uh, that was given <laughs> the whole section? What if we had done the most of the work for upgrade, but it's not in production yet? And newer version releases, we choose to upgrade to newer version. We will have to do all, not all of these steps and uh, jump into a newer version will take you much less efforts if you do it later. So probably you will, Depending on your solution, it will end up just one maybe day to do the upgrade for a newer version. But my best advice would be just use the newer, if you could. So I think that's it. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, please use the socials, uh, especially Slack, and follow me for any questions. I'll be answering all of them. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Martin. And yes, if if you have any questions, please reach out to Martin directly, or you can reach out to me as well on social handles, and we will try to answer your questions. And uh, thank you. It was an uh, insightful uh, session, and okay. it was great. Thank you all for joining. Enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.